tonight. An alarming checkup for this country's health care system. Canada tops the list for leaving objects inside patients after surgery. I was afraid to remove it because I wasn't sure if it was attached to my insides. Her troubling story, how it happens, what can be done to prevent it. Two young boys are found dead in their Ontario home. Their father charged. A lot of work to do to make sure that we're uh, governing for the entire country. Also tonight, the Liberals discuss their future. Rosie and At Issue are here. And serious questions about driverless cars. There may be an app for that, but it doesn't mean it's always legal. Stop, 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 stop. This is The National. Well, as if undergoing surgery isn't hard enough, there is a concerning finding when it comes to Canadian operating rooms. Medical teams leaving something behind inside the patient. We're talking about sponges and surgical instruments, and over the last five years, the number of incidents has gone up. According to a report by the Canadian Institute for Health Information, between 2016 and 2018, more than 550 foreign objects were left inside patients. That's a 14% jump over five years. And behind those numbers, real people dealing with real consequences. Here's Go Public reporter Rosa Marcatelli. When Laura Jockinen went into labor last year, the medical team attached a fetal scalp electrode to the baby's head while in the womb to monitor his heartbeat. Part of the monitor was removed from the baby after the C-section. The rest was left inside the mum, stuck inside Jockinen for more than two months until it suddenly and painfully discharged itself. It was at that point that I reached down and felt a metal device protruding out of my vagina. I can't believe I have to say that, but that's what happened. It looked almost like a battery and there were wires that were running uh, up inside me. So I was afraid to remove it because I wasn't sure if it was attached to my insides. That was the beginning of a frustrating battle with Vancouver Island Health Authority for answers. Why did it happen? What was the device made of? And could it or had it caused health problems for her or her son? At that point he was you know, two months old and I was breastfeeding. So I was really concerned about what risks it posed to his health as a, as a nur nursing infant. The health authority apologized, but couldn't conclusively tell her if the device was safe, saying it was tested for less than 24 hour use. According to a new international report that compares healthcare systems in developed countries, Canada has the highest rate of foreign bodies. We're talking sponges, needles, clamps, even scissors left inside patients during surgery or a procedure. That's 10 out of every 100,000 patients. The next highest is Sweden at eight, followed by the Netherlands with a rate of four. New numbers as well by the Canadian Institute for Health Information. It found in the past two years, 553 foreign bodies have been left inside Canadian patients. There are checks and balances that should happen. If there's enough preventative measures that should be in place, that these things should not happen. Jokinen was surprised to hear those numbers. That points at uh, a systematic flaw in our health care system. She's still watching and worrying about the possible health impacts of the medical mistake. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. So inside operating rooms, there are procedures in place to prevent this kind of thing from happening. But clearly, mistakes are made and learning from them is really important. Katie Nicholson spent today with nurses being taught some of those crucial steps. One, two, three, four, five. It sounds tedious, but as these nurses are learning, these counts Three, are vital four. to every surgery. What is important to note of why the count is correct? That just means that there's no surgical instruments or any sponges or miscellaneous items left Good. in the patient. Exactly. Moving on to sharps. Before the first incision and before the last stitch, the team counts every single item on the tray to make sure nothing was left behind. But if there are distractions or an emergency and that count is off, the pressure is on. And your circulating nurse in the room um, is, you know, searching the garbages, the linen, under the table, uh, or sometimes just recounting the sponges because uh, they could still be stuck together. And there are plenty of hiding places inside the patient. Feel your stomach right now, it's flat, but during lots of procedures we'll inflate that, so it actually can make quite a big cavity. So that's why it's imperative that we do do those counts because when you do make a bigger cavity, it can be easier to lose stuff. It's a moment surgeons dread. 
it's uh, frustrating because we know that we need to look for the missing instrument or the missing sponge. Uh, and if we can't find it, uh, we need to uh, take x-rays and that adds a lot of time and frustration for the entire staff. It's one of the many reasons Dr. Theodor Grancharov developed the OR Black Box. It records audio and video of surgery so teams can learn from past procedures and see where things went wrong. The Black Box has shown, uh, has shown us things that uh, uh, we didn't notice before. Uh, a, a typical example, one of the first things that we learned was the number of distractions in our operating theatres. So St. Michael's Hospital is eliminating some of those distractions. Other hospitals are starting to use the black box, but not all of them. One, two, three, four. So for now, these nurses will have to stick to the basics. So Katie, can we go back to something the doctor just talked about in terms of distractions? What kind of distractions? Well, you're in uh, a pretty acute situation. Uh, there's a patient on the table that you're directing your attention to, but there are machines beeping, there are people coming and going, and that was one of the problems that they had in the in the surgery theater, is that too many people were coming in and out of the doors. That was a distraction, so they've limited now the amount of times that people can come in and out of the surgery theater during, uh, during certain procedures. So I'm just imagining if you're at home, you've either just had surgery or about to, this is a bit terrifying. What, what do you look for uh, in case you fear this has happened. Everyone knows that surgery hurts afterwards. It's going to be tender and sore. What you're looking for is acute pain, far more than what you would expect mm -hmm. for this particular procedure, whatever you had. And also you're looking for fever. That could indicate that maybe something was left behind a foreign body and there's an infection. And advocate, advocate. Always speak up for yourself, yes. Okay, Katie Nicholson, thanks very much. You're welcome. Now, today's report by the Canadian Institute for Health Information zeroed in on a couple of other worries too. Women in Canada are twice as likely as those in 23 other developed countries to experience tears during vaginal childbirth. And Canadians are much more likely to experience avoidable complications after surgery. But there is also some good news. This country has one of the highest survival rates for both breast cancer and colon cancer. And the number of in-hospital deaths due to strokes and heart attacks has dropped significantly. A quiet suburban street near Toronto is the scene of shocking tragedy and incomparable betrayal tonight. Two young boys were killed in their home. Brothers, just 9 and 12 years old, accused of killing them, their own father. Ellen Morrow has the story from Brampton, Ontario. Jonathan and Nicolas Bastidis, described as sweet and mild-mannered by those now struggling to comprehend their tragic deaths. When we pass by, the parents, they always say hi to us. I'm in shock. They just never mentioned anything, nothing wrong, nothing domestic wrong with the husband. On Facebook, Edwin Bastidis appears to be a doting dad. He's now charged with first-degree murder. Police say someone in the home called 911 late last night reporting a medical emergency. Crews arrived on scene and though there were no obvious signs of trauma to the boys' bodies, their deaths were deemed suspicious. Police have not revealed if the boys' mother made the call or their cause of death. Forensic investigators worked through the night taking evidence from the suburban home. Police say they aren't aware of any past contact with the Bastidas family. But on what happened before the boys' deaths? Anything else to do with um, what transpired in the home, um, I can't speak to at this point. Neighbors say the family was friendly, outgoing, and that 12-year-old Jonathan had autism. Today at the boys' school, shaken parents forced to explain the incomprehensible to their kids. We'll have a conversation because I'd rather have him understand it through me than, you know, whatever rumors are going on in the school. Back at the crime scene, fall decorations sit on the front porch. A sign of family life now shattered. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Brampton, Ontario. And charges against a Winnipeg man accused of stabbing a toddler last week have been upgraded to second-degree murder. 33-year-old Dan Jensen is charged in the death of 3-year-old Hunter Strait-Smith last weekend. Now, Jensen is not the boy's father, but dated his mother on and off. He's accused of assaulting her in the early morning hours of October 30th, then walking to the home where Hunter was sleeping. Now let's shift to a federal focus and the Liberals' first meeting since falling from a majority to a minority governing party. And so let's go to Rosie in Ottawa. I guess, Rosie, even though they did win, many were still licking their wounds today.
Yeah, especially because some candidates from Quebec and all from two western provinces did not win. Now, while they won't have a place in the new parliament, as Evan Dyer explains, they had plenty to say about what the recent election results might mean for the future. This is a, a moment to gather amongst friends to reflect. Some of those friends are here for the last time, having lost their seats. In Quebec, uh, there's no question, I think four or five months ago, we didn't see the block coming up, and there are lessons to be learned from that. Bill 21, the Quebec law that bans religious symbols in public jobs like teaching, is popular in the province. Justin Trudeau publicly opposed it. Well, he took the correct steps, but it wasn't necessarily helpful electorally. And how did it impact you electorally? What were they saying? Well, I'm here for my last time, so that's how it impacted me electorally. The Liberals lost five seats in Quebec, but held on to 35. In Alberta and Saskatchewan, they lost four, but that was all they had. Perhaps the hardest loss was veteran Ralph Goodell in Regina. People were obviously uh, concerned about economic uncertainty. That is, uh, that is the, uh, the issue that was, that was uh, raising the anxiety level across Western Canada. Conservative premiers want the Liberals to cancel the carbon tax and build the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Goodell says one of those two things will happen. A majority of Canadians on, uh, on election night uh, voted very clearly for the completion of the Trans Mountain expansion. Uh, a very strong majority of Canadians also voted uh, for uh, uh, a more vigorous ambition with respect to climate change. We already have 3,000 people working in the line. There'll be 4,000 people working on TMX by December. We'll have 10,000 people working on that line by the summer. Making the kind of incomes that you make when you're building a pipeline uh, will help take some of the uh, heat out of uh, the, um, the situation in Alberta right now. The pipeline is scheduled to be finished by 2022. With a minority government, it's hard to say which will happen sooner, pipeline completion or another election. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Senators are also charting next steps to finally put a scandal behind them, compensation for the alleged victims of a former colleague. Don Meredith left the Senate in 2017 as he was being expelled for an inappropriate sexual relationship with a teenage girl. But he's also faced a range of allegations from former employees. Olivia Stefanovic shows us the debate senators are having on how to tackle the concerns of those alleged victims. So far, though, just behind closed doors. Do you believe the victims of John Meredith deserve compensation? Why is it taking so long to resolve this matter? Senators faced many questions, but gave few answers. It was in camera meeting, as you know, so I cannot talk. No, thank you, not for me. Are the me. victims getting compensation? No comment. Former Senator Don Meredith's first accuser came forward in 2013. Since then, at least six others have followed. It's a shame. It's a shame on the Senate as an employer to take that much time not to have been proactive. Their allegations range from Meredith inappropriately touching and kissing to exposing his genitals to bullying and intimidation. What did the administration do and the whips at the time? It's taken until now for senators to start quietly discussing compensation for the former employees. But so far, no resolution from the private meeting. We took these things seriously and we're addressing the issues and we're working on something. We're working, I think, on the right direction. Two women told CBC News they feel shut out of the process and they don't just want shut up and go away money. They want recognition of the fact that they were victims. Their lawyer calls this an institutional problem, and there have to be measures put in place to make sure it never happens again. There is a whole population of people who work in that environment on the Hill that won't have any recourse uh, to anyone who can advocate for them if they become victimized. They just don't. The Senate is reviewing its anti-harassment policy. What the women say they want more than anything is inclusion to be part of that change. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Much more to come here from Ottawa. I'll be back in about 15 minutes with At Issue, my favourite day of the week. Andrew Chantal, Althea are all here. Until then, back to Toronto. And we'll be back in just two minutes with more news, including the questions being raised after this, a driverless Tesla moving through a busy BC parking lot, sometimes in the wrong lane. Plus a marketplace investigation. You're not just imagining it. Restaurants are getting louder and it's affecting more than just your ears.
Okay, so they look like something from the future, but cars that are completely driverless are suddenly here. Just a couple of weeks ago, Tesla released a software update that makes it possible for some Canadian owners to summon their cars remotely. The trouble is, there is already evidence the technology isn't exactly road ready. Greg Rasmussen checked it out. And if I want to bring it to me, I'm going to tap on the word summon. So there, it's going to start moving in its own. In this mostly empty parking lot, Tesla owner Peter Levy shows how the feature is supposed to work. And it's got a little bit more to come. It's pretty accurate. Although it's working here, Levy and others say it's not ready for crowded parking lots, bustling with other vehicles, stop signs and pedestrians. But at the moment, I would not trust it if I was to get set it loose in a busy parking lot. I would be a complete nervous wreck. This video caused a sensation earlier this week. A car driving by itself in a busy Richmond, B.C. parking lot. Crossing yellow lines, confusing bystanders. One of many videos showing scrapes and near misses since the feature was introduced. Stop, 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 stop. Asked about self-driving Teslas, the Insurance Corporation of British Columbia stated, currently BC laws do not permit driverless vehicles on our roads. A vehicle being driven autonomously in a shopping mall parking lot is not allowed. Although driverless technology has been talked about for decades, little has been clarified or tested in court around many issues. Right away, the BC government and probably governments across the world are going to be looking at legislating quickly uh, to address this. Making sure it's safe comes down to provincial and federal agencies, as well as the automobile manufacturers, all saying basically it's a work in progress. Back in the parking lot, Peter Levy says he's confident features like this are the future, but it will need some tweaking. The Tesla offers it so that people can be beta testers. They can help to improve it over time. So you're a guinea pig? A guinea pig, absolutely a guinea pig, but we're willing guinea pigs because we want to see it succeed. Transport Canada says the technology is being monitored and that whether you're actually sitting behind the wheel or pushing a button on your phone, you're still responsible for your car. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, North Vancouver. Okay, among the other stories we are following tonight, Health Canada says there are two new probable cases of vaping-related illness. These latest ones are in British Columbia, making three in all in the province, and countrywide seven confirmed or probable cases of severe lung illness. The federal government is investigating the connection between vaping and serious health problems, and a number of municipalities across the country are looking into regulating the practice. Toronto superstar rapper is looking to capitalize on his global brand in the cannabis business. Drake has made a deal with Canopy Growth. That's Canada's largest cannabis producer. Together, they're launching More Life Growth, which itself will be a licensed cannabis producer, and Drake will own 60% of it. Canopy Growth has made quite a business of partnering with A-list celebrities. It's previously linked up with Martha Stewart, Snoop Dogg, and Vancouver native Seth Rogen. In Quebec, a student has had her residency application refused because she didn't demonstrate enough of a grasp of the French language. Except that student is from France. Comme une avalanche qui... Like being hit by an avalanche, she says. Emilie Dubois had just completed her PhD at a francophone university in Quebec City, but her thesis included a chapter in English because it was published in an English language scientific journal. But because the thesis was not entirely in French, the province said, you have not demonstrated you have the level of French required to be considered for permanent residency. Ministry officials now say the decision is being reviewed. And Ottawa sports community is bracing tonight for another hard hit. The city's professional soccer club is reportedly set to announce it will suspend operations. It's still unclear whether Ottawa Fury FC will fold permanently or just for one season. But the team's ownership group says it will be making a major announcement about the club's future tomorrow. This follows news just last month that the city's baseball team would also be seizing operations as they look for a new league to play in. All right, so time for a quick break. Up next, a CBC Marketplace investigation. It's not just about what's on your plate, why noisy restaurants could be harmful to your health. And later, a moment of kindness inspires a Cape Breton community to help a senior citizen in need.
Have you ever been to a restaurant and felt like you had to yell at the person across from you just to be heard? Well, it turns out sometimes that level of chatter and music and noise can be bad for you, and maybe in more ways than you think. Now, in this week's Marketplace investigation, Magda Gabrasolasi records the sound around her, and the results were surprising, even to a scientist. Dinner is served, and it's a feast for the eyes at this Windsor, Ontario restaurant. But what this place does to your ears... Yeah, it was too loud. Yeah, that I was screaming to talk to the rest of the table. Even the owner thinks it's too loud, but it comes with the restaurant's modern design. The, just the sound bouncing off of everything. It's a real problem. This right now is a real problem, so I've got to do something about it. We measured the noise levels using an app. During peak time, it lingered around 85 decibels. We asked Marketplace viewers about noise in restaurants. There were nearly 1,500 responses. 91% said restaurants are getting louder. 68% said they were bothered by noise more than price or service. And 63% left a restaurant because the volume was too much to handle. But it's not just your ears you should be worried about, says exposure scientist Rick Neitzel. He showed us how noise can affect your health with a simple experiment. First, without noise, he takes my blood pressure, 110 over 93, and my heart rate, 89. Then he played 30 seconds of noise at 90 decibels. So here, your blood pressure has now increased to 120 over 95, and your wow. pulse has gone up from 89 to 96. He says with noise, an average of more than 70 decibels a day could lead to hearing loss in the long term. But there's more. We do know from an increasing body of evidence that noise is also linked to heart attacks, to hypertension, to cognitive and potentially mental health impacts. So when we talk about these cardiovascular impacts, hypertension and heart attacks, we're talking more down in the 45 to 55 decibel range as a 24 hour average. We monitored my exposure over 24 hours. My average was nearly 78 decibels. The loudest part of my day was having dinner at a restaurant. Back at Nico Taverna, Politi has since addressed the noise issue. He installed sound absorbing acoustic panels, turning down the volume by half. Magda Gebrselasset, CBC News, Windsor. Now, as Magda mentioned, Marketplace did ask viewers which restaurants were noisiest in their city, and the restaurants that got the most mentions were put to the test to see the results. You can tune into Marketplace tomorrow night. It all starts at 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland on CBC Television. We'll be back in just two minutes. Rosie is next with Ad Issue. Liberal and Conservative MPs are back on the hill this week from Western alienation to potential leadership reviews. Andrew, Chantal and Althea are here. But first. In case you missed it, protesters have taken to the streets across Bolivia, angry over the results of last month's presidential election. You see, incumbent Evo Morales won, but not before the vote count was paused without explanation for more than 24 hours. Opponents say the results were rigged. And so cue the protests. This one yesterday turned violent. Men armed with sticks went after another group. Those shots you hear, those are canisters of tear gas being fired into the crowd, and a young man was killed. The mayor of one small town was humiliated, dragged through the streets, doused in red paint. Patricia Arce had her hair chopped off, and she was forced to sign a resignation letter. She was eventually rescued by police. Convocamos a los promotores de esta violencia. Today, the vice president called for calm, blaming the opposition candidate for not accepting defeat. Ustedes, señor vicepresidente, están provocando la acción violenta. But he is defiant, calling for a new election without Morales on the ballot. Canada, too, is calling for a runoff vote.
Peter Scheer is staying on as Conservative Party leader for now, but the questions he faced during the campaign... How has your opinion on homosexuality evolved? ...have not gone away, and the answers have not changed. Do you believe that being gay is a sin? No, look, look, this is... We made it very clear during the election, in the last few months and years, our party is inclusive. We believe in the quality of right, the rights of all Canadians. So is Sheer the right person to lead the party in this minority parliament and into another election? What do the months ahead look like for the Conservatives? Adishu is here to talk about that and more. Chantal Hébert is in Calgary tonight. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. And Althea Raj is also in Toronto tonight. Good to see everybody. Um, so it was an interesting press conference yesterday. I, a couple things struck me. Um, I guess how how little uh, Mr. Scheer had seemed to have moved or progressed in any of his positions that didn't uh, allow him to form government. Um, and I guess the, the idea that, that he believed a lot of that was a communication problem uh, during the campaign. Now, maybe he's just trying to keep things sort of, uh, you know, uh, on the straight and narrow until this review comes up in April. But uh, I, I wonder, I'll start with you, Chantal, what, what you made of what you heard from him yesterday. Uh, that he's going to have to do a lot more if he's going to win a solid enough vote of confidence from the party members uh, in April. I didn't expect him to have all of this figured out two yeah. weeks after the election, sure. but it was not the kind of um, press conference that uh, signals a lot of confidence or makes you say, finally, this guy you know, uh, is right. maybe the best prime minister that we'll never have. Uh, Andrew, I mean, I assume other things were happening behind closed doors. We, we know some of them, and, and certainly he seemed to be pretty candid, I'm told, behind closed doors with, with members, but that wasn't what he presented publicly. Yes, and the members decided not to take matters into their own hands via the Reform Act. They had the potential to do that, but they elected not to. So it will go back to the party membership. I, if I were conservative, I'd be very concerned about what the next six months are going to bring, because uh, he has far from putting aside some pretty fundamental concerns that a lot of people have about his leadership, but his ability not just to communicate with Canadians, but the positioning of the party and how he is seen. Um, I think, if you had to guess, I think the next six months are going to be very messy and ugly within the Conservative Party uh, and with a, the with a potential for a very inconclusive result at the end of it. Um, so they may regret not having, uh, the, the caucus may have reason to regret not having taken matters into their own hands. Uh, Althea, what did, what did you make of yesterday? Well, I don't think we actually anybody expected, except maybe Andrew, that the caucus would take the matters into I, their I own didn't hands. Expect <laughs> it. I just, just said they might regret it. <laughs> um, uh, Michael Strong's bill that allowed caucus to do that was not actually popular within most in the Tory ranks. So, I mean, it's not a surprise that they didn't go that route. Um, what struck me was, uh, to your original point, uh, was that nothing has changed from the campaign. He said the exact same words pretty much to the letter that he said uh, after election night. And so, you know, he's looking forward to bringing down the government at the earliest possible opportunity, which obviously makes sense for him. If there is such an opportunity before April, Andrew Scheer would still be the leader. The tone was the same tone. Coming out of 2015, you had Ronna Ambrose and a lot of conservative members of the back bench and the front bench come out and say, we learned the lessons of the campaign and we need to do things differently. Mm -hmm. We didn't hear any of that publicly this week. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting was he said communications, and yet he used the exact same line when he was asked about um, homosexuality being a sin. Uh, was a pretty direct question, but he used the exact same words, and that issue is not going to go away. That question, same-sex marriage and abortion, are going to continue to plague him, and he's going to have to address that in some ways. He said the review was going to be about the structure, was about, he, he suggested it was going to be about field and data. Um, Mr. Barrett suggests the review is much wider and more open. Um, Obviously, and interestingly, caucus chair also said that things were not unanimous behind closed doors. Yes. And to Andrew's point, we're going to hear a lot more about that. And the other reason why <laughs> they ahead. may regret this is it's going to be all about him. It's going to be about was he a good leader, was he a bad leader. Now, there's lots of reasons to criticize his leadership, but I think any fair-minded observer would say that the conservatives have much more fundamental problems than just their leader. They have to do a lot of rethinking about their basic approach, their basic policy approach. He has to take responsibility for the way in which they presented those policies and framed them in this campaign. But they've got to do a much more deeper rethink. And if all they're doing is having a referendum on his leadership, then that's going to be put off yeah. as well. Andrew is right that the problem is not just Andrew Scheer's leadership, but 
while he will be working to keep that leadership, he stands to lose control of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the two trains stand to go in different directions. I have a really hard time seeing how those six months to a year uh, coming forward will be anything but wasted uh, for the Conservative Party. There are a lot of Conservative MPs who would like to have a real discussion about expanding the tent. At yeah. the moment, the Conservatives are only basically drilling to their own party, trying to get maybe an extra 4%. Their electoral strategy is vote splits on the left. There is you know, the lesson of this campaign should be you got 16% in Quebec. You cannot get a majority government without reaching beyond your base. How are you going to do that? On what issues are you going to do that? Okay, I, I want to switch gears to the Liberals today. I, I, I wouldn't say that the, the, the pressure is the same uh, in any way, but uh, current and defeated MPs have been in town today, and the topic of Western alienation uh, came up, and Ralph Goodale was, was the one who talked a little bit about it. Here's what he had to say. I'm concerned about the situation everywhere in the country where, where unity or a lack of unity uh, is, is a very real issue. Uh, and in Western Canada at the moment, there are very substantial challenges that need to be met uh, and that will need to preoccupy the government. Uh, Andrew, what, what kind of signals do you think the, the Prime Minister needs to send both to these premiers that he's going to be meeting but also to the opposition leaders that he's going to meet next week? Well, there's a difference between what he needs to send and what he's likely to send. <laughs> uh, if the Liberals took seriously a sentiment in Western Canada, uh, we wouldn't be where we're at. Mm -hmm. uh, the brutal fact of the matter is they don't need to win a lot of seats in Western Canada to form a government. As long as you can get three quarters of the seats in, El in Ontario with 40% of the vote, you're halfway to a majority right there. Yeah. So they historically, going back for decades, Liberals have never really made a priority of trying to understand or reach out to the West. Uh, the numbers have changed over the years. It's more important to them politically, perhaps, than it might have been in the past, but not enough. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I, you know, I, if you look at his reaction since the election, I mean, the Encana thing happened and not a peep out of them. Uh, they don't seem to be changing their course at all in the, the signals we're getting out of the, the, the course of the, the cabinet, et cetera. I mean, they think that this was a referendum on climate change and they won. It's just that a lot of the votes went to other parties, but parties on the left. Uh, they think they ran a pretty good campaign comp given the challenges they faced with blackface, et cetera. Uh, they don't seem to be in a hugely reflective mood as a result of that. And so I'm sure he'll be reaching out to these premiers because he has to. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure he, it's going to be really the kind of life or death thing that people are perhaps urging upon them. But he too is going to have to uh, square a, a circle that's not easy to square. Uh, yes, uh, they need to somehow find a way to, to be as attentive to the prairies as they are to Ontario and Quebec. But Mr. Trudeau has a minority government now that depends for its survival on parties that actually want it to stop building pipelines, that right. go further with the carbon tax. And at some point, he, the first and foremost concern of, of the Liberal government is going to be, one, to ensure the survival of the government, and two, to be in a good place to win back a majority sooner rather than later. So how are you going to reconcile managing what is happening in the prairies and the political needs of the liberals that do not ride on what is happening in the prairies mm -hmm. is going to be difficult. And you can even say it stronger is they see their route back to majority in Quebec, yeah. not in the West. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it might even be impossible, <laughs> what, what Chantal has laid out there. Althea, go ahead. Well, you also have two premiers in Alberta and Saskatchewan who like want a fight um, and while the Prime Minister's office may say that the Prime Minister wants to sit down and find common ground and you know maybe there'll be something uh, in the budget that's an indication of a, an opening of some sort it's hard to see where that common ground can be found mm -hmm. to Chantal's point because the takeaway for the people around Justin Trudeau seems to have been that uh, this is a, a government and a parliament that should be more progressive and more focused on climate change and right now the discussions internally are as much about what to do about Quebec you know should they have a Quebec lieutenant mm -hmm. uh, how to um, address some of the fact that they lost a bunch of seats and they didn't have the gains that they were hoping to have and they have the block now and they're fighting with potentially uh, with Premier Legault uh, that is as much a preoccupation in some ways if not more so than I'd say uh, how to get a foothold back in Western Canada. So, so those meetings he has next week, uh, Andrew, with the opposition leaders, how, how important are those to, 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 to showing them that he is 
committed to sticking around a little while. I think, I imagine it's mostly just to, to nail down what are the areas in which they can work together. It's going to be different issues. It's pretty clear that they're going, they're going to go issue by issue, bill by bill. Yeah. Uh, there are different bills in which they could find different support from different parties. So as we've talked about, there was a two-thirds majority in this election for carbon pricing, but there was also a two-thirds majority for pipelines. There was a two-thirds majority to cut taxes uh, <laughs> at the bottom end of the of the. Uh, of the spectrum, so they'll, they'll find their support where they can. Just yeah. back on the premiers, it's going to be interesting to me to see what role, if any, uh, premiers from Manitoba and Ontario are going to play in this. With given Alberta and Saskatchewan have staked out such fierce opposition, uh, Doug Ford in particular, that government has been trying desperately in the last few months to stake out a somewhat more moderate approach to things. There's an opportunity for him, if he seizes it, to try to be an intermediary perhaps between the yeah. federal government and these more uh, antagonistic premiers. The takeaway in the Ontario Premier's office has been that a lot of the seats that he won went back to the Liberals. And they were Liberal and they went PC and provincially, but they went federally Liberal. Mm -hmm. And I think that that surprised some of them, uh, realizing that maybe it wasn't Mr. Ford's message, but really just the hatred of Kathleen Wynne that won them. And that there is now mm -hmm. a partner here that they might be more flexible to work with than they would have been six months ago. Okay, last question. I, I am yeah. hoping that it didn't take uh, the federal election for Mr. <laughs> Ford and his party to realize oh, that they owe power a bit, uh, to fatigue with the Liberals and Kathleen win, uh, but uh, to, to Ford's prob probable satisfaction, he can at least say that he didn't put his name on the federal ballot. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody. I'll see some of you next week. <laughs> Before we go, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast for extra content. This week, we are going to talk about Elizabeth May stepping down as Green Party leader. That, too, happened this week. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. And when we come back, a new name could soon enter the race for the White House. Plus, why the fight against climate change could soon end up in your kitchen. See you in two minutes. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, ransomware is a very modern problem. Criminals holding our data for cash. We'll talk about the evolution of ransomware and who the most likely targets will be. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Funerals were held in Mexico today for three of nine Americans slain in a violent attack earlier this week. Family and friends carried the coffins of 43-year-old Donna Ray Langford and her two sons, Trevor and Rogan. The dual U.S. Americans... U.S. Mexican citizens were members of a breakaway Mormon community living in northern Mexico. They were traveling in SUVs on Monday when they were ambushed, possibly by drug cartels. Two other women and four children were also killed. They will be remembered tomorrow. And the U.S. presidential race may soon get a new contestant with reports that former New York mayor Michael Bloomberg may enter the Democratic primary. Bloomberg is expected to file for the Alabama primary before the Friday deadline just to keep his eligibility alive. In March, Bloomberg said he wouldn't run. A spokesperson now says the billionaire would if he feels the current field isn't strong enough to beat President Trump. Meanwhile, former U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions has announced a bid to reclaim his old Senate seat in Alabama. Trump forced Sessions out as head of the Justice Department exactly a year ago after repeatedly criticizing him for recusing himself from the Russia probe. However, in a video declaring his Senate candidacy, Sessions focuses on his enduring support for the president. The 72-year-old held the seat for two decades before leaving for the Trump administration. And a judge has ordered Donald Trump to pay $2 million to charity. Why? Well, for misusing his own charitable foundation to further his own political and business interests. The U.S. president admits to letting his campaign staff help coordinate a Trump Foundation fundraiser in 2016, which was designed to further his political interests. Trump says the settlement is a result of, quote, politically motivated harassment. All right, time for a quick break, and when we come back, Long thought to be the better choice in the kitchen, gas stoves could soon become a relic of the past. We'll explain why next.
A lot of kitchen pros will tell you a gas range is where the magic happens. But for the environment, the chef's choice is not the best choice. And one California city has taken that choice away altogether. Kim Brunhuber takes us to places where the future is all electric. This house, it's not a home. It's something called the Smart Energy Experience. So I'm pouring my chocolate chips in. A showcase set up by Southern California's largest electricity supplier. And right here we have an induction cooktop for residential use. To convince customers to switch to energy efficient electric appliances. Because we're not burning gas, we're not releasing natural gas emissions. We're not creating any additional greenhouse gases. It might take more than that to persuade Californians to trade in their beloved gas stoves for electric. I can leave my hand on here all day. But eventually, many may have no choice. Motion carry. This summer, Berkeley, California became the first city in the U.S. to ban natural gas from all new building construction. Now, more than 50 other cities and counties are considering similar plans. There was a time where natural gas was considered a cleaner alternative to dirtier sources such as coal. But these days, he says, natural gas from buildings has become the second largest source of emissions after vehicles. Methane, when released in the atmosphere, is 84 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. That's why Santa Monica has become one of the latest cities to pass its own measures against natural gas. What sticks are available so that people are incentivized? Despite some opposition after from citizens. But you'll continue on with your social engineering and talk, taking away the residents' freedom of choice. And natural one powerful ally. Gas. Powerful, clean, natural gas. Who doesn't believe in climate change. In the absence of any federal action, we are seeing local leaders, both cities and states, stepping up uh, to really show what climate leadership looks like. Advocates say limiting natural gas is the only way cities will meet their climate change goals. And then there's the threat of leaks. In 2015, more than 100,000 tons of natural gas leaked from a storage facility in L.A. County, the second largest environmental catastrophe in the U.S. after the Deepwater Horizon spill. So when Berkeley took that, the first sort of big, bold action, uh, the rest of us said it's possible, right? And we said, we, not only is it possible, but it's not something that we have to wait five years to do. So unlike gas or... City officials say they're not going to rip gas stoves out of the residents' kitchens, but they warn eventually cooking with gas in your home will be as obsolete as cooking with wood. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Irwindale, California. Our moment is after the break. When we come back, how a fake lottery ticket led to a Cape Breton woman getting an upgrade on her house. What started as an act of kindness quickly blew up into a community helping a neighbor in need. But pride is a funny thing, and it took a bit of trickery to make it happen. Now, you may have heard about the Cape Breton woman who needed a new roof. She applied for a government grant but didn't get the money. So a local carpenter fudged the truth a little bit, creating a community effort to fix her house. And that is our moment. He's awesome. All his crew is awesome. They all are, and I can't thank them enough for what they did. I had made up a, a roof draw, like a raffle, yeah. to enter her in, and, uh, you know, we weren't going to actually publicize the raffle or anything like that. Uh, the ticket was just for her. We just needed her to, uh, you know, get past the pride thing and, and allow us to take care of the job. We got wind of what was happening here, and one of my guys contacted Locke about the chimney, and when they mentioned it to me, I thought, fantastic idea to get involved, trying to help this lady out. I love here. I wouldn't move here. No, it's quiet. It's, nobody bothers you. There's no neighbors around to torment me, so I'm happy. And the boys are happy, and they're healthy, and that's all that matters to me. I'll never forget them. No way. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, and they're friends now. We, we were talking about this a few moments ago. You know, this is a new show, obviously. We spend a lot of time talking about people who do terrible things to each other and, and scams that seem too good to be true and how to be careful. And <laughs> here's a case where it was, it really was someone just trying to do something nice and get a lady free roof. <laughs> but, but, but you know, the, the problem with a trick like this is that it only works once. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> and, and apparently, uh, they're not done with the repairs on the house. She, she still needs new windows, new doors. Uh, we believe that, that she has an application in for another grant. 
but who knows? I mean, if although. If you get it, they'll yeah. help out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm willing to bet where there's a will, there's a way. There's a Cape Breton uh, way. That, that house will be just fine. Uh, that's the National for this November 7th. Have a good night. Good night.